Hello, and welcome to the Movie Universe. I'm your host, Movie Fan. Today, I'm going to be doing something a little different today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Land Before Time franchise, and most importantly, where it all went wrong. Now, I'm sure we're all familiar with The Land Before Time. It's a true blue classic, one of Spielberg's best, along with one of the best animators of that time, Don Bluth, who actually helped to produce and direct the movie. As we all know, it's a story about a long neck named Littlefoot, who gets separated from his family in a great earthquake while they were heading towards the Great Valley. Along the way, he meets some other baby dinosaurs who got separated from their parents as well. Sarah the Threehorn, Spike the Spiketail, Ducky the Big Mouth and Petrie the Flyer. They join up together, and they head towards the Great Valley. And with them helping each other like real friends do, they make it. It was a story about friendship, and definitely one of the best ones to ever come out back in 1988. This movie was so beloved by children that it reigned supreme. They used to show it on television. You could find the tapes everywhere. It was a great movie for the whole family. Then six years later, back in 1994, the unexpected happened. They made a direct-to-video sequel of course, my family had to get it when that came out, and it was no problem for me because I was only eight years old then, so I enjoyed every minute of it. And as the title clearly implies, it takes place in the Great Valley. This is just shortly after they made it there, and it was actually pretty true to the first film. It was a great story about friendship and family and so on and so forth. I especially love how they accidentally bring a baby sharp tooth home that they named Chomper. It's always great when they try to stay true to the story, but of course, when you wait six years to try to make a sequel, especially a direct-to-video type sequel, there's going to be some changes. The first change is Ducky. She's not called a big mouth in this one. She's called a swimmer by the narrator. Because remember, in the first movie, she says that she is a big mouth. But she does swim, so that was more befitting. Another pretty big change was that Sarah was not a big jerk. As we all remember, in the first film, she was a jerk. For this story, she was grumpy, but she wasn't a jerk like she was in the first film, which I thought was kind of an improvement. Let's face it, who wants a jerk for a friend? But of course, the biggest change was that this story was a musical. That's right, they turned it from a serious drama into a musical. That's not to say that that was a bad thing, though, because the songs were actually very catchy, and they did blend in perfectly with the story. And they've done it like that ever since. In the Land Before Time movies 3, 4, and 5, we're introduced to different characters, awesome songs, we get to see more times with their parents and Littlefoot's grandparents, we get moments like Mr. Threehorn trying to be the protector of the water when they have a huge drought in movie 3, and we also see where Sarah kind of got her jerkiness from, because he was a little bit bossy. In movie 4, we meet a herd of long necks, especially a girl named Allie, and they all go on a journey to try and get some night flowers to try to help Littlefoot's grandfather who was sick. Oh, and fun fact, Littlefoot's grandfather is actually played by Kenneth Mars. You would know him better as the voice to King Triton. He played Littlefoot's grandfather all the way from movie 2 to movie 12. In movie 5, a plague of locusts clean out the valley, and the entire population has to move to a new location until the Great Valley's green again. Along the way, Littlefoot and his friends run into Chomper. That was a cute story because, you know, it was nice to see Chomper again. Although I'm surprised he learned English all by himself after he left with his parents. What was really interesting was that we see Chopper and his parents actually talking to each other. Because as we all have seen with every movie up until this point, all they do is roar and growl, which actually is a language for them. It was a great episode, except for one thing, the song Friends for Dinner. For some reason, Littlefoot's singing voice is Allie's singing voice. You don't believe me? Watch. See what I mean? After that, they did Saurus Rock. That was an okay episode, just a little kind of uh, Western kind of thing going on there. I say that because a part of the story talks about a long neck called the Lone Dinosaur, which in the end turned out to be just a story. Plus, a new character named Doc spoke with a Western accent. And then we come to movie seven, The Stone of Cold Fire. That is where it all went wrong. Because in this story, it starts with a meteor falling from the sky and crashing into the mysterious beyond. 
which is an area outside of the Great Valley where usually they don't like to go to because it's pretty dangerous out there. The next morning, Littlefoot is telling all the dinosaurs about what he saw, but nobody believes him. And two new dinosaurs show up talking about, you know, what the stone of coal fire might be. And they ask very intellectual questions like, why do you call the mysterious beyond mysterious? Why not the boring beyond? Or the, ooh, nothing out here of any interest to us beyond? These two rainbow faces talk on a very scientific level, which is very unusual for all the dinosaurs. And especially the story, since it's all about friendship and family not about science. Of course, after that, we get to meet Petrie's long-lost uncle, Tyranno, who was kicked out of the herd because he tried to be in charge and he led some other dinosaurs astray, and sadly, they were eaten alive by sharp teeth. They don't show that, but you know it's what happened. Now, this part of the story took place when the dinosaurs were heading towards the Great Valley. As we all remember, Littlefoot and his friends were not with them, and they do acknowledge that. Hence the point of telling them this part of the story. And that was a nice touch, actually, because, you know, you never really knew why all of a sudden they went from being in separate herds of long necks, three horns and all that, to being like one big herd of friends all together. But, of course, even that alone was not enough to save this film because it was pretty bad. The story was very subpar because... Tyranno was trying to find the Stone of Cold Fire so he could be in charge. And he was with two other flyers who were, well, clearly bad. One of them was actually played by the legendary Jim Cummings. And a good part of the story was Littlefoot and his friends trying to stop Tyranno from trying to take over the Great Valley with the Stone of Cold Fire. So, obviously, that was not a good plot. Tyranno even kidnaps Ducky. And while Littlefoot and his friends are trying to catch up to Tyranno and those other two flyers... They get help from the Rainbow Faces, who were watching them this whole time. And along the way, they finally get to the Stone of Cold Fire to realize there's no power here, and that Tyranno's not really a bad guy, although he was banished for the kidnapping. And in the end, we discover the Rainbow Faces are actually aliens from outer space, and that Stone of Cold Fire was their spaceship! You don't really see their real forms. They just trick Littlefoot into looking the other way, and off they ride in the Stone of Cold Fire. Do I really need to say how far that was pushing it? And if the bad story, the lousy plot, and the aliens weren't bad enough, the music was even worse. Watch this. Everybody has a lot of good inside them, and everybody has a little bad. Everyone is going to make you happy sometimes, and everyone is going to make you sad. And if you think that's bad, watch this one. This is the worst song I have ever come across in my whole entire life. You ever wonder what's out there beyond the mysterious beyond? Out past the smallest light that's twinkling, you cannot even have an inkling of what is going on. Beyond the mysterious beyond, out where the darkness is the scariest. You see what I mean? That's just horrendous. Beyond the mysterious beyond. What were they thinking? It was because of all this that I threw in the towel right there. For me, that was it. The worst movie ever! At that time, I was 14, so it was probably about time that I gave it up anyway. But still, had it not been for that, I probably would have watched a few more of those movies. Although, I will admit, I did check out the series when they premiered it, and it was not very good. I watched five minutes of that show, and I could not stay with it. For instance, Chopper's back, and I don't know why he is, other than the fact that he was a cute little T-Rex and a very popular character, but there was no reason for him to be there. And not to mention they have all kinds of other evil dinosaurs, and they actually have names! Which is not true to what The Land Before Time was. Every T-Rex, every raptor, every sharp-toothed animal was always called sharp Tooth. Except for Chopper, because, you know, he was different. He was raised by them, for a little bit anyway. But still, everyone else was sharp tooth. That's just the way it was. And for no reason at all, we get a new character, an oval raptor. Like I said, I watched five minutes of one of the episodes, and I could not stick with it. The plot was going nowhere so fast. 
that it was baffling. To make matters worse, the show was on at about 4 a.m., a time where nobody is awake, and DVR was not available for my satellite dish yet. In fact, it was still so expensive that a lot of people didn't have it. And who wants to be up at 4 a.m.? A lot of people say that when the movies hit the double digits, that's when it went wrong, but I say movie 7 is where it went really wrong. But you don't have to take my word for it. The only way you're really going to be able to determine that is if you watch every one of these movies from the original Land Before Time all the way up to movie 7, and then you can be the judge on that one. Because I stopped at movie 7, I cannot go any further, and I have no intention of seeing the rest of the films. Because, as we already know, there's a lot out there. And because they've made so many sequels, it's probably time to just end this whole franchise. So, have you seen any of the movies I've just talked about? Do you agree that movie 7 was where it all went wrong? Or do you disagree with me on that one? Feel free to let me know. This is Movie Fan, signing off.